right, welcome to the Pro Football Hall of Fame's Facebook page here on a great Friday afternoon in Canton, Ohio. Friday morning, excuse me, here in Canton, Ohio. My name is Jake Gray, and I'm the Youth and Education Manager here at the Pro Football Hall of Fame, and we are excited to bring you another live educational program featuring Mr. John Kendall, and we'll get to John here in a second. Our mission at the Pro Football Hall of Fame is to honor the heroes of the game, to preserve its history, to promote its values, and to celebrate excellence everywhere. And those values we speak on are those of commitment, integrity, courage, respect, and excellence all play a huge role in today's game and today's topic especially. Today, we're going to focus on Stark County and the Pro Football Hall of Fame. You know, many know that in Ohio, uh, football is very prevalent, a very hot topic every fall. Uh, and, that is, and that's at all levels. Uh, that rings true for us here in Stark County. You know, the Browns, the Bengals, and even some Steelers fans. Ohio State is everybody's team. You know, mostly, we'll, we'll, we'll say. And Stark County is home to one of the greatest rivalries in all of sports, especially high school sports, with McKinley and Maslin High Schools just right up the road here. Uh, well, all these are great topics, and I'm sure we could spend a whole time talking about them sure. alone. Uh, we're going to focus on Stark County's ties to the Pro Football Hall of Fame, the building we're sitting in right now. And we're lucky enough, like I said, we're going to be joined by Canton Zone, uh, Mr. John Kendall today. And John is the Director of Football information and archives here at the Hall of Fame. Before we dive in, I just want John to kind of give a brief overview of, uh, you know, what your job consists of and some of the things you do on a day-to-day -day basis. Sure. Well, well, thanks for having me again, Jake. Uh, this is a great opportunity to, uh, to share some football knowledge and a little bit about myself. But yeah, I was born and raised here in Canton, Ohio. So I was actually someone who thought, man, who the heck ever gets a job at the Pro Football Hall of Fame? Uh, and uh, was able to uh, get my foot in the door here as an intern and work my way up and um, ended up uh, becoming director of archives and football information here at the Pro Football Hall of Fame. And, uh, you know, part of my day-to-day -day job is, is really, like all of us, just serving that mission. And uh, I, I really feel like I'm a servant of the game. Uh, I take a lot of requests, whether it be from the media or uh, from NFL clubs or the NFL themselves, uh, asking about football information. And so uh, my role is to care for the 40 million pages of documents, the 6 million photographic images that we have in our collection here at the Pro Football Hall of Fame. And, and those relate not just to the history of the game, but really every player, coach, and administrator who helped build this great game to what it is today. And then we can disseminate that information, those stories of value that we talk about all the time, the commitment, integrity, courage, respect, and excellence. Uh, you know, we can, we can showcase that, uh, whether it be through uh, documentaries or articles or books, uh, we can get that information out to the right people uh, to disseminate that information. And so uh, it's, it's a, a great responsibility, but I, like I said, I really view myself as really a servant of the game and, and getting that information about all these great players because those same values that make you a great player on the football field the same things that make you a great business leader or a great artist or a great musician or a, a great uh, son or husband, you know, th those things don't discriminate. So, so, you know, we get visitors here at the, the hall of fame all over the world, all over the United States. And, you know, one of the main questions that we get asked here is out of all the places to visit, why do they have to come here <laughs> to tiny little Canton, Ohio? So the first question is, you know, why is the pro football hall of fame actually located right here in Canton? Well, it's, it's a great question because, um, you know, originally the site designation was uh, Latrobe, Pennsylvania uh, for the Pro Football Hall of Fame. And, uh, you know, ultimately uh, it didn't work out there for uh, very, uh, various reasons that we can get into a little bit later if we want to. But, um, you know, really the, the, the three main reasons why the Pro Football Hall of Fame was chosen to be here in Canton, Jake, was... Uh, um, you know, two historic reasons. One is the National Football League was actually founded here uh, almost 100 years ago. Uh, on September 17th, 1920, is the American Professional Football Association. And then two years later, they changed their name to the National Football League. And, and that was founded in Ralph Hayes Hutmobile dealership in downtown Canton, Ohio. Um, and then uh, the second was uh, Ralph Hayes' team that he owned was the Canton Bulldogs. And now the Bulldogs were uh, a professional team before the NFL was founded and they were a powerhouse. They had signed Jim Thorpe in 1915 and Jim Thorpe is one of the most uh, respected and well-known athletes of the 20th century. Um, but, but the Canton Bulldogs were also a powerhouse when the NFL was founded and uh, they were the first back-to-back -back NFL champions in 1922 
and in 1923. And then, you know, since we're talking about Stark County um, and, and the community, it, it really came down to the community uh, rallying together, putting together a well orchestrated and well organized campaign to get site designation here for the Pro Football Hall of Fame. And the community rallied together, raised uh, four hundred thousand dollars to get the building constructed. Uh, the city donated park land to the Pro Football Hall of Fame that we could construct the building. And so things moved pretty quickly once we uh, we got site designation here uh, in Canton, Ohio, for the Pro Football Hall of Fame. Now you mentioned Latrobe being uh, one of the other finalists. Were there any other finalists? Maybe a bigger city that a lot of people might go. Oh, you know, I could see it being there. Well, well, th you know, there's been a lot of talk over the years about moving the Hall of Fame to different places. But really, I mean, when it comes down to it, this is this is the place uh, for it. I mean, the historic ties. Uh, looking forward, you know, we were really looking forward to celebrating the NFL's 100th uh, 100th birthday uh, here in Canton, Ohio on September 17th, 2020. And with the pandemic going on now, you know, things are going to look a little bit different, but but we're, we're really geared up for twice the fun in 21, right. uh, where we're going to enshrine the class of 2020 as well as the class of 2021. And, uh, you know, we still do look and, and hope for a, a, a good celebration here to uh, promote the 100th birthday of the NFL on September 17th, 2020. It's going to be right here yeah. before we know it. Yeah. Uh, you know, so once we induct that, and like you said, you know, none of the festivities right now, you know, it's it's Friday of Enshrinement yeah. Week card by Johnson Controls. We'd be running all around the campus right now, but now we get to sit here. So I right. guess it's not too bad. Um, you know, once we induct that Centennial class next year and then in a class of 2021, we're going to have probably over 350 members uh, enshrined here in the Hall of Fame. And, and as of right now, five of those members are actually right here, have ties and are from Stark County, you know, and to kind of put that in comparison. So the National Baseball Hall or Hall of Fame at Cooperstown, they have five members from within 80 miles. Hmm. I see here at the Hall of Fame in Canton, we have our, those five members are all just within 20. And if right. you look at the Naismith Memorial Basketball Hall of Fame uh, in Springfield, Massachusetts, only one person. Hmm is from Springfield. Now, it was pretty important. It was Larry O'Brien, who's the trophy's named <laughs> right, after, right. But, but still only one. So the five men who really have a strong ties and are from this area are our Hall of Famers, Len Dawson, Dan Deardorff, Marion Motley, Alan Page, and Paul Brown. So what we're going to do is we're going to take a look at each of these individuals uh, and talk a little bit about their careers, uh, how they are tied to the city, and, you know, the important history of the game and the area. So our first Hall of Famer, is Mr. Len Dawson. And I'm actually going to throw it out to our museum to Jerry Shockey, who's the director of youth and education, who is standing in front of our Super Bowl four display to talk a little bit about him. Jerry, are you there? Yes, Jake, I'm here live. And we are here uh, standing in front of the Super Bowl four display, which is housed in the Lamar Hunt Super Bowl gallery. And behind me, what you see here is the jersey from Len Dawson, who was the QB of those Chiefs teams during those early years. And Dawson was a major factor for the Chiefs during the first couple Super Bowls. He didn't win every one, losing the Super Bowl one to Green Bay Packers, but he did lead his team to a victory in Super Bowl four. He was named Super Bowl MVP after this, the team's championship win over the Minnesota Vikings. Now, what you might be thinking is, what is Lynn Dawson's tie to Stark County? Well, it happens to be a very special one to me. Lynn Dawson went to very nearby Alliance High School, where there's a football field actually named after him. Well, it also happens to be the same high school that I went to that I'm very proud of. So, go Aviators. So, my question to you, John, is thinking about Lynn Dawson and, and what he gives back to the community and, and, and just thinking about the responsibility of, of, uh, of Hall of Famers and players to give back to the community. What kind of role do you think? Why do you think it's important for these great athletes to give back to the community? Well, thanks so much, Jerry, uh, for, for that question. And, and you know, for me, um, I, I think it's, it's very important for these players and these clubs to give back to the community. One of the things that I will say, though, is, um, you know, I don't think it's reported on enough how much these clubs and, and the players and the coaches are tied into the communities, uh, not just in Stark County, but really, um, you know, all throughout the country. I mean, you look at um, you know, the New Orleans Saints and, and what that organization did to help uh, rebuild New Orleans after Hurricane Katrina. You look at J.J. Watt and the Houston Texans with all the flooding in Houston uh, over the past couple of years and uh, what 
what J.J. Watt was able to do, not by himself, but uh, bringing people together. He has a platform to bring people together and, uh, and, and, and help rebuild that community. So as it relates to Len Dawson, you know, I, I think really it's, it's the values that, that these heroes demonstrate uh, on the field are great lessons for our youth uh, and then the community as a whole. And so we look at Len Dawson, I mean, perseverance is the value that really stands out to me with Len Dawson. Uh, you know, he was a number one pick of the Pittsburgh Steelers coming out of the draft. And uh, he sat five years as a, you know, seldomly used backup uh, with the Steelers and then with the Cleveland Browns, actually. And then, you know, getting his chance and his opportunity then with the Kansas City Chiefs and the uh, American Football League and, and becoming one of the greatest to ever play the game. Uh, you know, perseverance is certainly something that I think uh, everybody can learn uh, from, from Len Dawson. And it's very cool. And as you see, as we go through all these people, then, you know, they kind of each have their own special value that's tied to them. So our next guy we're going to talk about is, uh, is Hall of Famer, Mr. Dan Deardorff. So what is Mr. Deardorff's <laughs> tie to this area? So, yeah, yeah, Dan, uh, he, he uh, grew up in this area, uh, went to uh, Glenwood uh, High School, which now is Glen Oak in Plain Township. But uh, his father worked at uh, the Hoover Company. Uh, and, and uh, you know, Dan ultimately wasn't heavily recruited uh, to go to, to college, but ultimately got into uh, that university up north. Uh, we were talking about Ohio State earlier, but uh, I will mention that you know, he went to the University of Michigan and, and ended up, uh, you know, becoming a star there and, and, and getting drafted high uh, by the, the Cardinals. And, and uh, you know, Dan really... Um, not only represented Stark County so well throughout his entire playing career, but then ultimately had a phenomenal career as a broadcaster too, post career. And he's one of the few uh, pro football hall of famers that actually um, not only is enshrined as a, a player in, in, in Canton, but uh, ultimately won the prestigious uh, Pete Rozelle radio and television award, uh, which in that industry is, is one of the highest honors that you can achieve. So uh, kudos to Dan for that. And always, representing uh, Stark County so well. So, so during his enshrinement speech, and I'm gonna read the quote here, Deodore famously, he unscrewed the light bulb from the podium timer that told him, hey, you gotta be done, get off the stage. And he announced that, my name is Dan Deodore, I'm from Canton, and I'm proud of it. We know how special the Hall of Fame is to us as Hall of Fame staff, uh, and to all of the Hall of Famers who are enshrined, but it's also so important to the Canton community. So when Deodore mentioned this in his speech, you know, I personally believe he echoed a lot of the same, uh, you know, sentiment that, that people have from this area. So why is the Hall of Fame such a special part to this community? Well, being born and raised in Canton, you know, I, I, I do feel like uh, I, I can speak on this and, because I, I was always one that, man, I loved, you know, growing up, you know, going to the Pro Football Hall of Fame or, or digging into the history of the game because I felt like I was a part of the history of the game right from the get-go because I was born in Canton, Ohio. Um, but, but then you look at, at all the things that we've done and, and how we've grown over the years as the Pro Football Hall of Fame, and we could not have done that without the support of the, the local government, but, but also the, the citizens of this community. I mean, uh, you know, as we uh, would have been you know, throwing the, uh, you know, putting on the uh, Hall of Fame week powered by Johnson Controls this, this week, we would have had nearly 5,000 volunteers that would help us, you know, welcome all these greats back to Canton, Ohio. We call it their, you know, their second home. And, uh, you know, just making them feel loved and, and welcomed. And we could not do that. We could not put on the, the size of events that we do every year without all those volunteers and all those people that, that come out to support uh, not just the Pro Football Hall of Fame and its events, but all those former players and coaches and contributors uh, that, that come back here to uh, kind of, and, and the fans, and the fans as well, to kind of uh, envelop themselves in, uh, you know, football and the history of the game. So. It's definitely pretty cool. You know, I also grew up in the area about, about 20 minutes away. And, you know, for me, it was something that, you know, when we would be traveling across the country or something, someone would say, hey, where are you from? And, you know, oh, I'm from Canada. They go, oh, you're from where the Pro Football Hall of Fame is. And to us, it's like, well, yeah, you know, it's kind of just right there in our backyard. So I believe it's something that 
you know, we personally sometimes take for granted. Right. But then when, like you said, when you talk about the history and everything, how cool it is, you kind of see the football world come back to Canton every year. Well, and to that point, just quickly, Jake, I, I, you know, I think when you say that and you, you travel around to the other communities uh, within the country or, or throughout the world and you, you mentioned Canton, Ohio, oh, the Pro Football Hall of Fame and, and Canton really has become synonymous yeah. with excellence. Yeah. And, and to me, that being, you know, <laughs> being born and raised here, it's, it's a, a badge of honor and, yeah. and pride that, you know, when, when people say Canton, they think excellence mm -hmm. and the Pro Football Hall of Fame. So you're right there. So speaking of being born and raised here in Canton, Ohio, we're going to get to our next Hall of Famer, the great Browns running back, mm -hmm. Marion Motley, who might have the closest as far as location ties here to the Hall of Fame and actually was the first Hall of Famer to be enshrined that was born and raised in Canton, Ohio. So what is Motley's background and what is the important piece of Stark County history tied to him? Well, and I think Motley's an interesting, uh, interesting character in the story because, you know, he was born in Georgia and at the age of three, he and his family moved to Canton, Ohio. And, and he actually played uh, his high school football at Canton McKinley um, and played in Fawcett Stadium, which was the stadium just adjacent to the Pro Football Hall of Fame. Uh, and, and doing some digging, it was interesting to see uh, his record while he was at uh, Camp McKinley was uh, 25 and 3. And the three losses that he had uh, as a player for Camp McKinley were against Paul Brown's Maslin Tigers. And uh, Paul Brown ultimately remembered what a great player that Mary Motley was and, and ultimately signed him to, to play for his Cleveland Browns franchise in 1946. And we'll get into a little yeah. bit of, of why that was significant. So, you know, you know, part of our job you know, is we get to display artifacts from guys like Mary Motley, the greatest to, to ever step on a football field. So I'm going to send it to uh, our summer intern here, Amanda Stewart. Uh, who is in front of one of those artifacts for Mr. Motley. So, Mandy, are you there? I am, Jake. Thanks. I'm standing in front of one of the contracts signed by Marion Motley and Cleveland Browns coach Paul Brown, which you and John are going to be talking about here soon. This contract made Marion Motley one of the four African Americans to reintegrate the game of football. This was a huge turning point in not only the game, but society as a whole. I'm sure all the fans tuning in today know that Marion Motley uh, reintegrated the game one year before Jackie Robinson reintegrated the Major League Baseball. And like Mary Motley, because of his accomplishment, I am proud to say that I graduated from Canton McKinley too. Thanks, Jake. So John, when we look back on Motley's career, what was the impact left on the game of football and ultimately the community that Mary Motley grew up in? Well, man, I think you said it right there. I mean, uh giving you the pride to say, yeah, I went to the same school as Mary and Motley. And, and I think that has an impact, um, you know, not only on the community and the youth um, uh, in that community, but, but then, you know, from Mary and Motley's standpoint, uh, his impact really transcended the Stark County community. And, and, you know, there's that sense of pride there as well, but, you know, his impact uh, really, uh, goes all across the country and, and at a time when uh, he really broke down barriers of uh, social injustice that was going on in this country um, and, and helped really start kind of this uh, um, revolution to, to make sure that, uh, that everybody was treated equally. And, and I know we're still going through a lot of the, those things now, but um, you know, I do think that uh, the best is yet to come and, and, and we're going to continue to, uh, to uh, listen and, and uh, make positive impacts uh, moving forward. Uh, so we're gonna move on to our next guy. And while Marion Motley might have the closest physical location, uh, our next Hall of Famer, Alan Page, might just be even a little bit closer. Uh, so who is Alan Page and why is he tied in not only to this area, but the building that you and I are actually sitting in today? Well, Alan, actually, uh, he graduated from my alma mater, uh, Canton Central Catholic, and so I have a lot of pride there. But, uh, you know, he's a great role model for people, both on and off the field. Uh, he did it the right way, always. And uh, his ties, uh, not only to the community, but to this building, uh, when he was in high school uh, in the early 60s, he, um, he worked on the construction of this building here. Uh, so... So to be able to be enshrined here in the building that you actually worked and helped build um, is pretty remarkable. 
Uh, but, you know, he always had a dream of becoming a lawyer and, uh, you know, got his education, got drafted, uh, played in the National Football League for many years at, at a very high level. But while he was playing uh, in the NFL, he also went and got his law degree, uh, ultimately becoming a judge and then um, at the end be, um, being appointed to the uh, – uh, Minnesota Supreme Court. So, uh, you know, he still to this day preaches education mm -hmm. and has done so much to impact the youth in this country. So, they, you know, people say that Yankee Stadium was the house that Ruth built. So the Hall of Fame is truly the house that Alan Page built. Right, so, right. Physically. Brick brick. <laughs> so you mentioned, you know, him getting that job as that Supreme Court justice. You know, a lot of players, you know, their, their career comes to an end. They, you know, they become a coach. You know, they ride off into the sunset, enjoy retirement. But like Paige, a lot of people, you know, kind of get that second career. So uh, why was this so important for him? And, you know, like you said, why was it such a, a monumental job for him to have after, you know, his playing career? Well, I, I think, um, you know, you, you talk a lot about, um, you know, character in football and, and uh, teamwork and, and, and building a team. And, and I really think uh, his um, – his uh, level uh, level headedness on the football field really helped him uh, in his post career uh, journey as as a lawyer and as as a you know doing it the right way all the time and being able to uh, really uh, look at cases uh, unbiased and 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 really uh, you know I, I think uh, that is probably one of his best character traits. So last and certainly not least, as we mentioned, we have maybe the most notable uh, person from the area is Paul Brown. And, you know, if you are from the Stark County area, you definitely know who he is. Uh, but it might be for a different reason than, than someone else, depending if you're a high school fan, a college football fan, or a professional football fan. Uh, we know that Brown is, is the namesake for the Cleveland Browns. You know, he coached the upstart Cincinnati Bengals after he was enshrined here in the Hall of Fame. But what kind of impact did Brown have at the high school and college football level. Well, I was going to say, you know, what impact didn't Paul Brown have <laughs> on uh, all the levels? I mean, like you said, high school, college, and pros, um, you know, he was a winner at all three levels, ultimately uh, also coaching at um, uh, the Great Lakes Naval Academy. Um, and, you know, for me, you, you look at Coach Paul Brown, and uh, I think his biggest impact was more – not just on the game, but really, once again, on society. Um, Coach Paul Brown did not care what kind of race, what religion, uh, what economic background you were from. Uh, if you could help his football team and you were a quality individual, he cared what kind of character you had. Uh, he, he wanted you on his football team. Uh, and, and that showed when uh, he signed Bill Willis and Mary Motley. Like Amanda said, one year before, Jackie Robinson uh, integrated Major League Baseball. Um, Willis, Motley, Kenny Washington, and Woody Strode for the Los Angeles Rams, uh, they re reintegrated pro football. And it was really uh, Brown who was that driving force in the All-America Football Conference that, you know, I, we have a letter down in our archives uh, from Bill Willis to Coach Paul Brown congratulating Brown on being uh, appointed general manager and head coach of the Cleveland Browns. Uh, and in it, Willis asks him to give him a, a coaching recommendation. Well, Coach Brown, he didn't want him to coach. He wanted him to play on his team. But Willis, knowing how society was, didn't think there was an opportunity for him to continue his playing career. But Coach Bro Paul Brown said, no, you're going to play for me. And he went out and also signed Marion Motley as well. And, and those players both had huge impacts on and off the field and both reside in the Pro Football Hall of Fame from that. So uh, when you talk about Coach Paul Brown's impact on the field, uh, we can go, you know, through all sorts of different things. But, uh, you know, his impact on society, I, I think, is um, not showcased enough. So you talk about, you know, like he said, such a great person off the field really changed the game. But he also changed the game on the field, right. with, known as one of the greatest innovators of all time. Some of the stuff he was using back in the 50s is still being used or just starting to be used today. So what are some of those innovations that, that Paul Brown had that you've recently seen come about? Well, certainly, and I don't know about just recently come about, but uh, 
but coach Paul Brown, he, he was a, a teacher by trade and, and, and then got into coaching the sport. And so he brought a lot of that educational classroom work into the sport. And, and you see it a lot today, especially with COVID-19 and, and not being able to be on the practice field hitting and, and things like that. They're doing a lot of classroom work and, and mentally challenging these players so that when they get on the football field, they don't have to think about it so much. They just go out there and react. And so, you know, from, from the classroom work to the helmet receiver, the coach to quarterback communication, Paul Brown was a guy that he wanted control. And so Otto Graham, uh, you know, was a phenomenal quarterback in his own right, uh, went to 10 straight championships, winning seven of them uh, with, with the Cleveland Browns. But when, when Otto Graham retired, you know, Coach Brown didn't have that comfortability with his quarterback being able to, to uh, you know, basically be a coach on the field or be him on the field. And so he started working with radio technology and put a helmet receiver in George Ratterman's helmet uh, so that he could communicate with George Ratterman. It was ultimately outlawed um, early in the season. Uh, but then decades later, the NFL adopted that and, and allowed a coach to, to communicate with their quarterback for a certain amount of time. So that, um, you know, in-depth scouting reports. Uh, you know, there were scouting reports being done before Coach Paul Brown's time, but the way that he, you know, we have these down in our archive collection, his scouting reports that go player by player. What, what's their strengths? What's their weakness? How are we going to attack this player? And he would not only distribute those to his assistant coaches, but those were going out to all of his players as well so that they knew why the team was scheming the way that they were scheming. And uh, that helped Coach Brown and the Cleveland Browns create a dynasty franchise uh, during the 40s and 50s. So those are five individuals that have ties here to Stark County, all of which had their own impact on the game, whether it be on the field, off the field, like Coach Brown. And, you know, it's just not those five individuals who've had an impact on the, on the, you know, the Stark County area. So many other individuals. And then the area itself being such a supportive factor to, to the game of football with everybody coming back here. Uh, around this time every year so as you can see without Stark County the game of football would look a lot different uh, you know than, than what we see on TV or in the stadiums today so so I can truly say as someone who grew up in the area that we are proud to be home in the Pro Football Hall of Fame and we're excited to all the excitement that's going to be coming here to Canton in the years to come that's going to be it for us today uh, for everybody who's tuned in make sure you subscribe follow like all of those different things all of the Pro Football Hall of Fame social media channels uh, to stay up to date with all the news and programming and content here at the Pro Football Hall of Fame. Next week, we're going to bring you a special Heart of a Hall of Famer powered by Extreme Network classic replay as we go backwards to 2015 to show you a program that we hosted right here at the Pro Football Hall of Fame with Hall of Famer Bruce Matthews. So make sure you guys tune into that. So for myself, Jerry, Amanda, and John, we want to thank you for tuning in today. And we'll see you next week, or we'll see you in two weeks because you get to hear from Bruce Matthews next week here on the Pro Football Hall of Fame's Facebook page. Thanks, you, everybody.